Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus died for sins, was buried, and on the third day was raised again according to the scriptures for our salvation. It is through Jesus alone that we are reconnected into a right relationship with God. Reconnect us, O Lord. Hey, this is Andy Rasman. Uh, we've had a two-month break, maybe two-and-a-half-month break from Reconnect. So this is episode 64, just getting back into it. Connie Schram, who was on episode 7, which was speaking on the messianic prophecies that some people say have not been fulfilled by Jesus. You can go back to that episode. She knocked that out of the park. It's wonderful. That will be linked on this episode's blog post at andyrasman.com. That's W R. A-S-M-A-N for the last name. A lot of people don't really know how to spell that last name. When they see it, they definitely don't know how to pronounce it. I say Rasman. Everyone in my family says something different. Uh, there's Rossman. There's Rasman. There's Ras with an S. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pronunciations. Pretty interesting stuff. No one knows how to pronounce her name. I guess you have to go to Germany to actually know. So, Connie Schramm is back. Uh, she's the Old Testament teacher at Korean Lutheran High School. We are celebrating our 10th year. Uh, so this will be her 10th year of teaching Old Testament to freshman students at Korean Lutheran High School in Irvine, California. Uh, so check out her episode. With us today also is Jonathan Pratt. Uh, his brother was just recently on this podcast, David Pratt. Yeah, he was right. speaking on apologetics. Uh, if I remember right, your brother said he was trained to teach music or instruct choirs, but for whatever reason, God had other things in plan, the church, the schools that he ended up teaching at. That's right. Had him teach theology classes instead, leaning towards apologetics. Uh, but you are now with us at Korean Lutheran first year. Uh, can you please explain all the many positions and hats you'll have this year? Please. Well, I'm, ex- I'm excited to be here at Korean Lutheran. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been great, a great experience already. And I get the opportunity to work with orchestra and jazz band and then also three choirs here on campus as well. And then I'll do a little bit of oversight when it comes to the, the chapel worship and the praise band that we have on campus. Right. And so Jonathan's intro just right there helps explain why I wanted him on this episode, uh, because we are going to be speaking about church choirs. There was an article that I saw shared a good bit on social media a while back, and it was mostly people that were into choirs and loving choirs that were sharing this. And obviously it started a little bit of hoorah online. Because some people are like, how dare you say we must bring back a choir? You must be saying what we're doing is wrong in our church by not having a choir. Uh, So just to unpack this article a little bit more with two people that have quite a bit of choir experience, uh, that's what we're going to do today and obviously connect it to the theme of this podcast, which is sharing the gospel. And that happened to be one of the points for why we should have the choir. And I would like to speak on that eventually at some point. Uh, so this is a post by Jonathan Eigner called Nine Reasons to Keep the Church Choir Alive. It's on his blog post, or it's on his blog, Ponder Anew. His blog is found on patheos.com. He says he is a director of music for a PCUSA congregation. You guys familiar with PCUSA? A little bit. Yeah, not so much. Okay, so they are the very liberal Presbyterian branch in America. Uh, so I think they actually said gay marriage is acceptable in their churches. They definitely have gay clergy, openly gay clergy. That's sort of where they are, uh, female pastors. And usually when that's some of your main tenets that you're known for, then you can kind of expect the rest of the theology to be not accurate with Scripture. Uh, yet he identifies as a United Methodist. So that, that, you know, if you're... The Methodists are kind of going that direction too. So he identifies as Methodist, but somehow is working in a PCUSA church. So... Uh, his theology probably will, well, I could say, is not going to be in alignment with ours whatsoever, but he's not speaking theologically here. He's talking more on his role of director of music in a congregation. So before we get into this article, which is linked on this episode, I wanted to ask uh, Jonathan and Connie a few questions about their choir experience. So what are your experiences with choirs, in particular church choirs, either being in a congregation that has them or being in a member of a choir or even directing a choir? Well, I've been in choirs since I was in the fourth grade at my church up in Stockton, California. So I've been singing in choirs 
I'd say almost all my life and all the way through my adulthood as well. I've also been actively involved in children's music and children's choirs um, in the various different Lutheran churches where I've been uh, teaching and actively involved. So I've had a lot of experience with leading choirs, whether it be in the school or whether it be connected to the church and mm-hmm. helping out in that realm. So, you know, I I have enjoyed it. It's something I look forward to. It's something I miss because currently our church doesn't have a a, reg, a choir that meets on a regular basis. Mm. We meet for um, uh, large functions to do, you know, large festivals and things like that, but not necessarily the everyday yeah. Sunday, and I really miss that. And you said we, so you're a member of that choir when you guys do meet. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Jonathan, what about you? Yeah, and I've grown up singing as well. Um, it was, I guess, my first instrument, if you will, um, sang all the way from elementary school through college. Uh, since then, I've had the opportunity to conduct uh, multiple choirs everywhere from kindergarten through adult. And since Connie and I both go to the same church, uh, I was actually surprised to hear that our, our church doesn't have a regular choir. But it sounds like that's something that uh, that may happen in the future. That maybe you, Jonathan, need to look into. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. <laughs> Not his first year teaching at a new school. Now, Jonathan, you were teaching and conducting choirs at your previous school, right? But yeah, it was a public school? Yeah, previously I was at a public charter school up near Sacramento. That was a K through six, uh, a K through six school. So obviously no sacred focus to mm-hmm. that. And so being here at Korean Lutheran now, I, I get to have three choirs that have a specifically uh, intentional sacred focus to them. Okay. So let's, since you both have choir experience, both white choirs, a question I then want to ask, which I think is important with everything we do in the church in terms of practice, is is there a biblical purpose or role behind it? Is If it's not commanded in Scripture, is it at least supported as something that would be good to do in church life? So is there a biblical purpose and role of singing in a church service first before we even get into the choir element, just singing in general? Do you need to have singing in a service? Because I know most services I've been to have songs. Can you not have singing and it still be a service? Or what are your thoughts on any of that? My opinion is that is that singing is uh, a natural outpouring of who we are as humans, and that that singing is a way to not only convey uh, information and belief, but also a way to to um, share our affect, share our emotions with with other people who who are in the same service as us or um, are in the same family as us, if we sing with our families, or the same school choir as us. And so I think singing is a perfectly uh, natural thing that humans do, and to have it in a worship service is is ideal. Well, and I think Scripture obviously supports all that too, because we go through, um, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, we're told to sing, sing praises to God. The book of Psalms is strictly a hymn book for mm-hmm. the Hebrew people for the Jews. And so it's always, it says in there a lot, praise the Lord. It is good to sing our praises to God. It is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. You know, in Colossians, singing praises and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness and hearts to your God. Uh, Psalm 95, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So singing is something that is consistent all the way through mm-hmm. scripture. Even in Acts, Paul and Silas are in prison. What are they doing? Singing. Singing, yeah. Yeah, you know, so, you know, it's, and, and worship doesn't have to be necessarily inside a, a structure of a building. Mm-hmm. You know, your, your praise and worship can happen all day long. And so you're singing all day long in various different ways, you know, you can to the Lord, and that's an act of worship as well. To that point, I wanted to bring up, uh, the introduction to the, uh, 1982 Lutheran worship hymnal. Mm-hmm. It, it, the introduction starts, Our Lord speaks and we listen. His word bestows what it says. Faith is born from what is heard, acknowledges the gifts received with eager thankfulness and praise. Music is drawn into this thankfulness and praise, enlarging and elevating the adoration of our gracious giver God. So when our Lord speaks to us through his word, it's a natural outpouring for us to use those words in our praise. And like I said, I think singing is is a great way to do that. Yeah. You know, and just to play off of that... um, People who sing, you know, are already God's people, and they're singing in response to what God has done for them. So to just kind of support what it is you were saying about that. Yeah. Okay, so I have some questions. So I definitely see where you're coming from. There is definite support in Scripture for singing praises to God. 
Uh, Connie, one of the verses you referenced talked more about making a joyful noise in your heart. Does that necess- Is there a difference between singing in your heart would be a question I have. Uh, but with it, um, Acts 2 says that when the believers gather together daily, they broke bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. So I'm curious if that praising happens to be singing, just when, at least in English when I hear praising, I don't necessarily think the praise has to be singing version. Uh, and then having favor of all the people, because they were selling their possessions, giving them to the poor. Uh, so the Lord added daily to their numbers. So I'm just uh, curious if there's if we're looking outside of Scripture. I think looking at Scripture examples you gave, even that verse could support that they're actually singing together. I don't know if it necessarily has to. Um, to praise someone, does it have to be singing? Is there a historical precedence we can see of singing in Christian church services? Does that go back to the earliest times? Uh, was that something they were doing in the first century? Uh, or even within the history of the Jews worshiping in, in the temple or in the synagogues, do we see anything of them when they're together, whole congregation singing? Absolutely, absolutely. And when um, I was thinking of... Um, uh, you were talking about in actual worship. I was thinking outside of worship. I was thinking of David when he played his instrument for, for Saul. Mm-hmm. And, and when he would sing those hymns of the Psalms that he was writing to Saul, Saul's evil spirit was quieted. Uh-huh. It was, it was sent away. And as soon as he stopped playing the music, that evil spirit came right back again. Right. So, I mean, that was out, outside of worship. So getting back to inside of worship, when Solomon dedicated the temple, um, we see that he tells the Levites, who were the singers, according to Second Chronicles, that all of them, and he names them all, that he says that the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, his mercy endures forever, and so on and so forth. So we see that even Solomon was commanding that the Levites sing in the worship service. So Mm -hmm. it does go all the way back. And, of course, we know that instruments from all the way back in Genesis with Ubel is the first one who creates the stringed instrument. So we see how that was already being done, and his instrument was being used to actually praise the Lord. That's what he was using it for. And I'm pretty sure not every Levite was one of the temple singers. So No, it was a set of Levites. He yeah. commanded the Levites were broken up into certain groups, and each group had their own function, and there was a group of singers. And Asaph happened to be one of the names, and you'll see that commonly in mm-hmm. the Psalms. Isn't that how the body of Christ works? is that everybody has their strength and everybody has their desire to serve. And, and singing is one of those ways that, that we group together and, and uh, are able to express that. Mm-hmm. Well, I know like I've been on some construction sites and there's always music playing on these. Const- like people have special DeWalt construction boom boxes that they have, which, you know, are running off the typical batteries that we use for like the power drills and stuff because the construction site doesn't always have electricity so it's interesting we always have music playing in the background of our lives um, no matter what we're doing most of the time Uh, so it's interesting that when they are building i think in ezra when they're rebuilding the temple you mentioned solomon the dedication but i think in ezra there's even talk of the temple singers there as well that's right. Being involved in the rebuilding and then the dedication when the foundations yeah. laid. Yeah, right. Ezra and, and, and the, the accountant uh, Nehemiah at the dedication, it, it, it says that they celebrated the dedication with gladness, with thankfulness, and with singing, cymbals, harps, and lyres. Uh, the sons of the singers all gathered together uh, uh, inside of Jerusalem, and they purified themselves, they purified the people, they purified the gates, they purified the wall, and then they got up on top of the wall and appointed two great choirs to give thanks. And so that was obviously a central part of that that uh, wall dedication. Yes, it's definitely been a part of God's people uh, throughout history, having this, this choir element to our work and worship. Yeah. And, and even the choir element for the Jews had its ebb and flow. There was a time when it was very strong and there mm. during the time of Solomon, and then there was a time when it fell into disuse because of the idolatry that the Israelites had fallen into. But then, as we just heard, it comes back again with Nehemiah, you know, where it's being brought back again and people are coming back to the Lord. So it almost seems like the choir was a reminder that we are God's people. We're coming back to the Lord, and the choir was a part of that, that leadership of worship. Which is showing unity, too. That's something Jonathan mentioned, how choir, or singing, you said, unifies people. And so it's interesting, you have a group of people together singing, which are then prompting and helping everyone else join along. Uh, so let's, let's look at some of these 
reasons that Jonathan Eigner put together. I'm just going to read uh, the bold bullet points he gave and get some feedback from you two on it if you think he's on point or not. So he said, choir support, good congregational singing. I think some of what you've already been sharing has lent itself to that. Two, their visual presence is an encouragement to the congregation. Three, choirs make a broader repertoire available for a worship service. They can offer more, four, they can offer more difficult and complex music than is possible for the greater congregation. Five, choirs help singers develop and improve their musical gifts. Six, participation in choir ministry can be an avenue for introducing outsiders to the church and the Christian faith. That's the one I thought that could connect to this podcast's theme of sharing the gospel. Seven, the choral process reflects the mission of the universal church. Eight, a church choir is an open, welcoming, and diverse group. Nine, they add creative artistry and beauty to a worship service. Okay, so those are his nine points. Can I get a short synopsis of how you would rate his reasons? I wouldn't say that they're bad reasons. I I do find it interesting that he he generally makes sort of a, a human attempt to justify the use of a choir rather than looking uh, to the early church and looking specifically to Scripture for justification as to why a choir is is helpful or useful. I would would say because we see choirs used in multiple books of the Bible, uh, angel choirs mentioned in Isaiah, Luke, and Revelation, um, the fact that God uses singing in such a structured way where even the angels are worshiping their creator Mm -hmm. and proclaiming God's very words to us humans, that should indicate to us how much God values choirs. Yeah, and you know, just playing off of that too, the choirs when they sing is like a reflection of heaven. You know, as you were saying, the angels are singing and a reflection of Isaiah and John talking about the angels in Revelation and what the saints are already doing now in heaven and so for just a moment while we sit in worship and we are hearing the choir present Mm -hmm. their worship to the lord you know and they're in a response we can just for a moment be transported to heaven you know get a glimpse of of the glories of the music that Mm -hmm. i mean it pales by comparison but nonetheless we realize that all the saints in heaven are singing and we're joining with them yeah that's good i I like that you Being typical Lutherans, our formal principle is Scripture alone. So why should we do this? You're looking to Scripture first for your justification and answers. And then secondly, you look to the history and tradition of the church uh, to see if there has been a precedent before us of this. If we're doing something completely astray from what the church has done throughout its history, we should probably go back to the Scripture and make sure what we're doing is not going against Scripture. Again, not looking to that tradition to justify uh, but looking right. to the tradition to guide right. how has this been done in the church before? Because we have great freedom in Christ to worship. Um, it doesn't have to be a certain way necessarily, as long as Christ is first and foremost. Um, obviously, that needs to be unpacked a lot more. It doesn't have to yeah. be a certain way. That could be an entire right. episode yeah. to explain what I just said there. Hopefully, <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> say. hopefully we don't have to do that. Well, um, and the precedents you mentioned in the in the in church history mm-hmm. is really interesting. Because we have an example that was found back in the early 1900s of a papyrus that dates back to the end of the third century of of a of a church hymn, a Greek Christian hymn that contains the text and the melody. Uh, It was pretty boring by today's standards as far as melody, Um, but but the text was Trinitarian, and, and it and it could possibly even have dated back maybe a half century earlier to when Tertullian himself, uh, himself was alive. And, and that's an example of the church very early on, uh, singing, uh, in unity, sharing their hymns, writing them down to share with others, not just using oral tradition, but actually wanting to save and preserve the art of singing together. Um, and we know for a fact also the ancient Greeks, even just in a, in a secular realm, they valued music for many reasons. Um, in Greek dramas, for instance, the chorus would sing their parts. Uh, there, there's additional value to even, even in a secular setting, uh, singing uh, words together as a group. Uh, so I think there's quite, quite a precedence 
in and outside of uh, the church uh, for the use of, of singing together in a choir. Yeah, great. So that's that's a really good, I think, critique. Go to Scripture first. Uh, but before we dig into more like which reasons did you like or not like, I was just going to throw something in, Jonathan. You mentioned angel choirs singing. Uh, I always, I mean, this is one I need to study more, but I'm just throwing it out there for everyone to mull over in their personal time to dig into Scripture a little bit more. Uh, Wes Bearford, who's been on this podcast a good number of times, listens. I think he heard this from Don Stewart, one of the Calvary guys that has a radio show near us. I think it was Don Stewart, but it was probably from one of his Calvary shows that he sometimes listens to on the way. In the, he said that the guy said, nowhere in Scripture do angels sing. Uh, no. And it was interesting. <laughs> I then started to look into it. Like Revelation, for instance, I, I got it right here. Revelation 4, 8. You got the uh, cherubim and the four living creatures. Each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say. Uh, and then holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. And I always pictured them singing. And then like Luke, the angels that appeared to the shepherds. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory. So again, praising maybe doesn't have to be. Singing. Yeah. So it was interesting. And he's, the, this guy just said, if you go through anytime you see angels, it's not singing. It's always saying, which I thought was just, which goes to your point too, Jonathan. This is singing is something that's very human. And I think that's what this guy was, his point on it was singing what the humans will be doing in heaven. The angels. I don't know if that's a point to even really go into. I just thought it's a fun fact. I don't think that's salvation affecting in any way. Just something to consider. I'm not trying to say you're wrong because I haven't dug into it enough, but every translation I looked into that one day when Wes first brought it up, I couldn't find sinking on some of the key verses I would have gone to. Did, did you find anything, Jonathan, looking at it? I'm, I'm trying to glance through it right now. Um, Sorry, I'm not the, trying no, to... No, you're right. The examples do do say that, that they say to one another. I, I would I would submit uh, that in Luke 2, when it talks about the angel hosts... Praising and praising saying. Praising and saying. So what about um, when they show up and they're singing to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest? Well, that's what it says, praising God and saying Okay, but glory do you know that God. in our liturgy, in the Lutheran liturgy, we use those same words, praising God and saying, and what is our response? We our singing response. But we, <laughs> but again, that would be the point. The people are the ones that sing. And again, maybe that's why I always thought they were singing. Anyways, it's just interesting just throwing it out there in case someone listening is like, but I've heard just... I wonder. It over, look into yeah, it. I have to I go wonder, back and really look because I I always just assumed the angels were singing. Me too. You know, they were praising God and singing, even though it says saying singing. Be, we turned it into song, you know. But I don't know. I'll have to go back and look. My brain is not pushing would, down that realm right now. I would wonder what it would sound like if we had a multitude of the heavenly hosts what is, saying something together. I yeah, imagine yeah. that if shepherds on a hillside heard. A multitude of angels saying something, it would ring. Yeah. It would sustain. Yeah. yeah. It would vibrate yeah. for a while. Yeah. I bet it would sound an awful lot like our singing. It's the angel army host. My Think singing. about <laughs> my flat well. tone singing. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go up and down and pitch? <laughs> it's okay, I'll just stay right here. <laughs> You're very steady, Andy. Very steady. <laughs> okay, anyway, sorry sorry to throw it out there, just something I've I've heard. People could dig into a little bit more. I don't think that goes against any of the scripture you guys were using to support this being a precedent in scripture as well as throughout history. I would say, however, if Jesus did it on the, the right before his passion, mm-hmm. it's good enough for me. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll leave with that one. <laughs> what would Jesus do? <laughs> have you had a, Have you had a, a podcast on that topic? No. You can create it for me, and we'll do it. Let's do it. Find, find, Might find be a two-hour segment. For yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, so that, that's your synopsis. Go to Scripture first. But since he didn't really do that, uh, which reasons did you like the best or agree with the most that he listed? Jonathan did just... Well, I thought, <laughs> I thought, since Kanye doesn't have one ready, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I found it interesting to, to read, if, if the listeners go on and, and, Read the bullet points, but then read his explanations below. Um, his bullet points tend to be 
accurate, and some of his explanations tend to go, I'd say, a little bit outside of what of what Scripture says. We're going to talk about, I know, point number six uh, later, so I'll leave that one for now. But I, I would say, for instance, uh, point nine, they add creative artistry and beauty to a worship service, and I'm sure that, that connects as well with uh, point four, they offer more difficult and complex music than is possible for the greater con- for the greater congregation. Mm-hmm. I know when when Johann Sebastian Bach got to um, the church, I think it was when he was in Leipzig. The the town elders, the town council told him not to write the music that he ended up writing. He actually he actually got in trouble for writing uh, melismas in the voice and for writing all the notes and all all the quick passages that he wrote because they wanted to focus on on not having ornamented music and uh, an mm. excess amount of notes but i don't i feel that bach would, would have been correct in this aspect that having uh creativity and artistry and beauty in a in a worship service and in individual pieces is not a bad thing but it can be a bad thing uh, when it becomes the focus. So right. I, I, I would say, for instance, like, uh, like, like point nine, the creative artistry and beauty, it's a great idea. I'm not sure if it's a reason specifically, like I said before, to salvage the choir, uh-huh. if that's a, a redemptive reason for the choir. But that is something that, that ought to happen in a worship service. We should have beauty. We should have, because God created it. It's, it's a first article gift from God. Right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. When it gets in the way, that's a problem. When that when that gets in the way of the congregation uh, hearing the proclaimed gospel, um, well, that's a huge problem. And and so there's not a problem with it. I, I would say having artistry and beauty in a worship service is is a is a valued part or a, va- a valued point that he included in that list. You know, in the number um, five, when he was talking about uh, choirs help singers develop and improve their musical gifts. It's not only their musical gifts that are being improved, but it's also a benefit to them in terms of the the emotions and the chemicals that that are produced in your body when you sing. Um, you you get this surge of endorphins, you know, in choirs, either when you're listening to them and when you or when you're actually participating in them. Um, dopamine, the transmitter in the brain that's associated with feelings of pleasure, is increased as a result of that. Um, music can lower um, your stress. It can, the cortisol, you know, that's a, another chemical, you know, it lowers your stress level in your body. You, you mentioned know, so David and, and Saul before. Yeah, and yeah, and the, your serotonin levels, you know, all of things are affected either by listening to them or actually participating in them. Um, that, that's a benefit. But this, that, that definitely a benefit. But would that necessarily not come along with singing with a band, like a mic? singer or two with a band do you think well that we get but endorphin things still there i mean i know people go to concerts and they're like yeah and yeah well like, we often it's a, true. and they're singing along with the bands like not the bands i go to but you know bands that a lot of people go to everyone's singing every word you know I well the benefit is the going to be your spiritual level because okay. you're hearing the gospel of yes. jesus christ so your spirit is also being bathed and that's the bigger part right. of it and i think that also increases all of those those chemicals in your body because your spiritual Life well, but I'm also... talking about in the church. You have a band in the church, and oh, people I are see singing. What you're and I was just saying, I was going here. Like, definitely, people. I'm talking like secularly on the secular level. People right. go to concerts and spend tons of money. Why? Because they're getting some lift out of it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going. So, in the church, if you have a band, could do you think that same elements there? Is it missing in some way? Did, did the study happen to mention that at all that you saw? Okay. No. I, I would say the endorphin and, and the science aspect, the chemical aspect of it is is important for us to understand obviously science again a good gift that we uh, that we ought to study as as much as we can um i think that is a, an added benefit uh-huh. to the idea of singing and the idea of music because it clearly uh can calm us it can clearly hype yeah. us up depending on the type of music we're listening to but that that question or that point would raise the question for me is that a good reason to do it only on its own, right? And I, I would say neither yeah. of us, none of us would say that it's it's the sole reason for doing it. But 
it's an amazing way that God made us. That, yeah. that exactly. the, the sounds that go into our ears can not just be heard, right. but can act, actually affect our being right. at a chemical level. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so it, it's more like a reason to say you shouldn't have, you should, you shouldn't give up your choirs because you're also giving up a gift from God that comes through right. choirs. Yeah, those benefits yeah. Are, are clear. And so with, with, with point one that he gave, <clears throat> choirs support good congregational singing, I think the idea is the, the singing response, the singing along with may be removed uh, when it's just a band and not a choir, I think is what he's trying to So maybe coupling that with this uh, research that shows singing along with helps release these certain chemicals, which are certainly uplifting to our mood, um, could, could really go together well. And if that becomes a focus, then it gets in the way. That's because in reality, uh, we the, be endorphins, at... the endorphins don't increase our, our personal faith. Right. Uh, the Holy Spirit does. Exactly. Right. And exactly. so exactly. When, when the focus yeah. is in the wrong place, well, we're, we're, we're looking in the wrong direction. And then we start per- pursuing the experience. Exactly. Right. Going. Right. And I think that's something, that's something he mentions also in that ninth point where he talks about the, uh, Hillsongization. Yeah, uh, th- it that it's about the experience. In fact, I used to go. I'll admit it. I used to go to a church uh, here in Southern California that wrapped up every service saying, um, "Thank you all for coming today. We we always get together to experience God." And then he would kind of wrap it up with some announcements or whatever else. And it always struck me as odd because, it, it, sh- sure, mm. uh, God is present with us in our yeah. worship. Uh, God is glorified in our worship. Um, he is there with us, uh, with, with his body and his blood. But the experience being the focus mm-hmm. really puts the, the, the subject, really puts the focus on I'm, us. I see so you're right. the subject of the sentence again. And, yeah. and while, while I'm, I'm a proponent of saying that, that we are being served by God in worship rather than us serving God solely in worship, uh, we're still not the focus. Uh, we're not. We're, it's not. It's not only uh, one directional, and it's certainly not about us uh, getting an experience. Yeah. But I think I the focus say. is on receiving uh-huh. and responding. Yes. So it's receiving first. That's the big focus. Jesus came to serve, right? Yeah. Not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom. So yeah. the service. Jesus is coming to serve us. So we are the the passive. And grateful receivers, mm-hmm. and but in worship, as we are receiving, we're also responding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're responding, and that's what we were talking about. That's what these choirs do. They're responding to what God has already laid out for them, and we, as congregational members, are doing the same thing. Yeah. We are responding in hymn. We're responding in prayer. We're responding in a variety of different ways in worship to what God is giving to us, exactly as, uh, what we are receiving mm-hmm. from Him. So to put it, like you said, as an experience, that changes the subject of the sentence from Jesus being the one who's serving us to us coming and saying, hey, we're going to experience you today, God. <laughs> it's all well, about what Well, that's what, what some of our do. songs say, you know, right? Exactly. I'm here to do this. Exactly. I'm here to get this. Yeah. I think I think it's just vague language to experience God. It's too vague. It yeah. needs to be more clear about what. What well, do you I mean think by that? Yeah. yeah. But bottom line, I think it's a misunderstanding of what worship is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like in our Lutheran church, we have divine service. That does not mean that the Lutherans have a service that is divine above everybody else's. That's not what it means. Divine means it's God coming God's to serving. us. Yeah, it's yeah. God serving us. Exactly. So I think there's that misunderstanding of what yeah. worship really is. Well, let's take a break right there. Connie did just mention divine service. I had an entire episode unpacking what that means. What is the divine service? What do Lutherans mean when we say that? Uh, pastor Jaime Nava walked through this entire thing. And he's a pastor that went from the big band, no back and forth liturgy stuff, to being full blown. Church liturgical calendar, divine service, why would you have it any other way? So uh, I think he's a good person to hear explain this. Yeah. Um, if you're in this camp going, well, why not have the big band? Why not just, you know, have the top hits being played from Hillsong every week with the sermon thrown in the middle so we can, quote, experience? So listen to that episode. I'll put that linked uh, on this one as well just so you can find it easier. All right, we'll be back in just a little bit.
Hey, my name is Joel Esch. I'm the editor of Fishing for Leviathan, a web blog committed to the ongoing conversation between technology and theology. While I'm neither a full-blooded Luddite nor a Kool-Aid-drinking technophile, I do have a substantial interest in the ways that digital texts and classic embodied theology work together and sometimes fight to the teeth, continually shaping the culture around us. The website is www.fishingforleviathan.com. You can also track our Facebook page, which collates some of the more interesting articles on digital technology as intellectually satisfying content for your own conversations at home, school, and or your parish. Our Facebook page is www.facebook.com slash fishingforleviathan. Offer your own voice in this ongoing conversation. Be a part of a growing community that keeps its eyes up toward each other and not down toward a screen. We look forward to hearing from you at fishingforleviathan.com. To financially support Reconnect, visit contradictmovement.org and order your copy of Contradict, They Can't All Be True. Contradict stickers and tracks are also available. Again, that's contradictmovement.org. All right, we're back. Next question. Which reasons did you like the least or agree with the least? And if you're listening, please, I hope by now you've at least pulled up this Jonathan Eigner's article of these nine reasons. His blog is Ponder Anew, Pathios.com, linked on episode 64. So maybe pull that up if you haven't yet. All right, which reasons did you like the least? Well, I'll go out there and say that I didn't think his first two reasons were all that strong. Uh, the, the choirs support good congregational singing, and number two, their visual presence in is, encur- is an encouragement to the congregation. I said before, I think his reasons are are a little bit um, earthly rather than rather than kind of biblically or, or divine focused. Yeah. Um, I think they're they're pretty weak in general. Since I, I would say a congregation should be offering their praise to God based on their own faith and piety and desire to sing God's words back to him. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the choir necessarily should be the um, the assigned reason why, for instance, uh, me as a husband or father, if I'm in church on any given day, uh, whether I decide to sing, uh, whether I decide to, to praise with the rest of the congregation. Rather, um, I would say that it should be because I, I I know what God has done for me, mm-hmm. and I know that I'm hosed without Him, yeah. and I know that now is my opportunity to join with the other believers in the building to to pray, praise, and give thanks. I I I think attributing that desire as a as a congregant to the choir rather than to the Holy Spirit. I think I, I think it's misplaced. And I would have to agree with that because I know at our congregation we have various organists who come in and they will play for us. And when the service is over, they always say, we love coming to play here at your church. You are small, but you are singers. Yeah, we belt it out. And we've got no choir. Yeah, yeah. We are the choir. <laughs> you know, the congregation is the choir. And so if we had a choir up there, it's not going to... It's not going to be what he said, like a visual presence is going to make the people want to sing more. We're already singing, and I think mm. your point is well taken. It is because of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, how does that come? Through the preaching. We have incredible preaching. I'm just going to say it, at Faith Lutheran in Capo Beach. We have incredible pe- mm-hmm. preaching there. You know, And the preaching that is coming is coming straight from Scripture, and as it's coming from Scripture, the people are moved to respond through music and if anything i would say that the crucifix the two crucifix mm. in front of the yeah. congregation that's that's my encouragement present. there you go that's my encouragement <laughs> to sing out yeah. uh, that's my encouragement yeah, to, that's to a stay good focused during worship and once again you're pointing to the fact that you're singing as a response to faith it's a response to what you're hearing yeah, yeah. okay so let me uh let me throw in some little different takes on there because i go to a congregation we do have a service with the band. We also have the service where um, it's the typical, you know, keyboard that's set to sound like an organ. And in that service, I've been to it twice, 
there is no lead singer. So think about your congregation. You do have Connie, who's been in choir since fourth grade, who can read music and knows when to start. <laughs> I don't know if you've been on services where the choir, the organ leader's playing right. his thing, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, okay, one, you're not riffing the actual main thing. Where the, you're, you're not playing the riff, <laughs> that, to my terminology. You're not playing the riff. You're playing all sorts of interesting ornamentation. means nothing. And then all of a sudden you're supposed to do this, bang, like you hit this chord, and that's supposed to be the cue. Okay, I guess now we're supposed to all jump in. <laughs> and what if no one, no, what if no one starts? What if it's kind of like you have to have some good leaders in that congregation to get it started? Now maybe your pastor is also gifted in this regard, and he helps belt it out from the front, and everyone hears him. But if you don't have that, at least the minimum, a leader on the mic. So I just don't go to that service. I go to the one with the band because I don't know what I'm supposed to like. I, Who's singing right now? What what are we doing? (laughs) And I've been to a couple churches like that. So you guys are, you know, gifted. So this may not even just be, some churches don't have the band and they don't have the, they don't have the choir either. And they don't have your experience of these people. So maybe it's your current, because I know your church too has a lot of people that probably have, or are professional church workers because they teach at Concordia Irvine. You have a lot of profs that are daily used to this and probably even been trained in it as well. So maybe, well, what do you think about that? If you have, a, if you do have a choir up there, his, his argument was, um, you're not alone. So if you are in that church where you don't have the leader, you don't have, I, I agree with you guys, you need to be singing regardless, right? If the people around you are or not, you need to be the one doing it. Uh, but if people aren't singing, it does throwing a choir in potentially help spark that congregational singing? I, w- I would ask the same if question it's not happening already. is if if I had a, a gentleman up in front playing the acoustic guitar mm-hmm. uh, with a single mic on his voice and a, a high schooler sitting behind him sitting on the cajon playing along and the congregation wasn't really into it, uh, <laughs> would, would adding an extra singer make the congregation more into it? Well, would adding two extra singers, would adding 20 mm-hmm. and calling them a choir, would that make the congregation into it? And I would submit that no, no, and I would agree with you because would, pretty soon yeah. the pretty soon the band becomes the leaders, and people just mm-hmm. sit there and I'm just listening. listen, and they don't participate. When this is supposed to be a response from them to yeah. God too, yeah. and they don't respond anymore because it's so loud or it's so um, overwhelming that they just sit there and yeah. let it happen to them. And, and I've seen that happen with choirs as well. <laughs> um, Churches that sometimes add the choir, that sometimes becomes the effect, especially when they have, quote, special music. Or they do. The choir sings this part, everyone else sings this part, and it's kind of like, why? Because you're better? You 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 don't want me to sing right now? Like, when do you want me to sing? Well, Is this you for the show or not? If, especially if they start getting into the whole choreographed swaying stuff. Oh, like, yeah, that's oh a, this is definitely now yeah, the that's show not, for Yeah, the that's choir. not what we're talking about. But, you know, <laughs> if, if you notice, they do it on specific verses, though, Andy. Okay. And when they do it on those specific verses, they're trying to highlight something specific. Maybe even it's, it's, it's pointing towards heaven or a response of the angels in heaven. And so the choir is going to sing as a way in which the angels would do so, quote, in heaven, we get back to the angels singing again. But, you know, they do that. So it really depends on the verse. They don't just do it like, well, some churches might, but but most musicians are intentional where they yeah. have their choir sing because they want they want the congregation to sit back and receive what is coming to them. And part of that then needs to be explained. And oh, I agree. And yeah. sometimes yeah. what yes. I've seen, I've uh-huh. been to some churches which do have the choir, and the choir is definitely not even seen. They're in the back lot. Mm-hmm. Right, so there's that, that throws his whole thing out. They don't even have a visual presence there at my grandparents' yeah. church. The choir is literally up above, and the wall of the loft is so high, and they're so far back from it. You look back there, you don't even see them. Yeah. I hear them. That's awesome. Which could they're, be, they're which, pushing you forward from behind this thing. I guess it, that could be yeah. nice yeah. that they're out of mm-hmm. sight, right. so it, it keeps your focus on that even more and, so not on yeah. them. Which I like. I like which, that. Which I, has pers- value. I personally like that I because it keeps my focus on on the words and mm-hmm. what's going on instead of on the people that are actually singing the words when I may not be focusing on the words, but I'm going, Oh, cute haircut. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you've yeah. seen, you've seen the, the church and I guess I could call it a stage instead of uh, mm-hmm. the altar where the, the singers with their microphones are in the front of the stage. And if there is a cross, it's behind them. Yeah, so, yeah. so they are in the way essentially of you seeing, yeah. hopefully the reason why you came to the church. That Which day. Um, I went to a church in, 
Uh, it's outside of Milwaukee, Brookfield Lutheran Church. Seems like a pretty big church. Um, they have a lot of people there. Um, they have a service with the choir, and they have the band kind of on the stage, like you said. But the way they had it set up didn't seem like a stage at all. Um, they had the main lead singer was on the piano way off to the side. And the people on the instruments were, uh, the cross was still in the center, and they were beside the cross. That at least on a lower level, like cross is even on a higher level, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and so the, it's really, it intentional. They're, they're all peripheral, yeah. and the drummer's way off on the side too, so it was like, it wasn't like, they were definitely not the front and center. That at least shows you that they have a sensitivity towards, oh, yeah. uh, towards the focus. So yeah. I mean, it, it can be done well either way, potentially, depending on the songs chosen. Potentially. Um, so anyway, just some good, good feedback there from you guys on that. I appreciate it. Love hearing from people that actually <laughs> been singing a lot <laughs> and a part of choirs. Uh, next, next question I want to discuss a little bit on was number six. Do you have any experience on that? His number six argument was that participation in choir ministry can be an avenue for introducing outsiders uh, to the church and the Christian faith. Has, has that been your experience at all in your? time with choirs either directing or just being a member of i heard a story growing up of a, of a gentleman who joined the choir at my at my like i said growing up in my home congregation who met his wife in choir because he just liked to sing and happened to find his wife there now i'm not sure if that necessarily uh, uh was the reason that he that he has penitent faith in in jesus but it at least was a motivator for him to be involved in choir. He has a beautiful voice to begin with, but at least that is what caused him to walk into the door to rehearsal. And so I think if you take choirs away, there's a variety of reasons that God wouldn't want us to do that. And I think there's a variety of blessings for keeping it. And although I wouldn't put this as, you know, number one, but I would certainly say, yes, that fellowship that comes as a result of being in the choir mm -hmm. is is very different if you don't have that. I mean, if, if you have a choir, you have an opportunity for people to get together once a week and have fellowship and to understand the music that they're going to sing, yeah. not only the words, but also the music itself and why they're singing it and why they're doing it. And it, it's an, an opportunity for their mm -hmm. faith to be increased as well. Yeah. Well, like you said, this gentleman liked to sing. Um, I was, one reason I wanted you to show that you were at a public school before. Mm -hmm. How many of those kids like to sing in that choir? It's an elective. They didn't have to be in there. They weren't forced to be in there. Uh, when they graduate from high school, what if, where are they going to find a choir? You know, um, probably more than likely a church if mm -hmm. they're going to stick with this. Um, so you may have people in that scenario that, well, I was in a choir in high school. Um, we were singing, you know, we wish you a Merry Christmas. But I still want to have this this that dynamic that I had before. Um, and the only opportunity they would have would be in the um, public sector for like the um, public choral groups that are right. out there in the in the county, like in Orange mm -hmm. County, they have the public singing groups. Fortunately, so. I know Concordia Irvine here has a oh, has corral. a master's chorale yeah. that's very high quality. In fact, I think it requires an audition to be a part of it. it does. And they sing very serious works. Yeah. But they rehearse once a week, mm -hmm. like. Uh, like most church choirs might, and they are serious, intense rehearsals, and I think they're singing a, a Bach yeah. mass uh, Dr. this Bush year. Dr. Bush is excellent. That's yes. right. Excellent there. Yes. And they have a very high output because they're working with a very talented director, uh, a very talented accompanist, and very talented people walk in there knowing that it's a high quality of music that they're going to yeah. put out. Well, number six really struck with me, too, because that's my grandmother's experience. Um, she became a Christian uh, through some tent revival that was across from her house. She wandered over there to see what was going on. I guess this was back in the day where you would allow your kids to wander over to a big tent crowd unac unaccompanied. <laughs> uh, so she became a Christian through, this, through hearing the gospel at this tent revival. Um, and from that, you know, the way the, the tent got rolled up and moved on to another town, but she wanted to go to church then. And she would get on a bus by herself every Sunday and say, is this the church that goes to whatever Lutheran church? And they would say yes or no. And then she would get on the bus, right, or not. Uh, so I, 
I think that was interesting. And she got plugged into the choir there. Very young age, like you. Um, and her father, that never went to church, would go when there was a special choir performance. So, you know, so she would sing in the church service, but when they have those special events where the choir is singing, that was the time that her father would go. And yeah, obviously, that's, like, that, that's when the father gets to hear the gospel. Right. And that's like in our Lutheran schools. You know, we always have choirs in our Lutheran schools, and that was a way in which uh, parents who just sent their kids to a Lutheran school but didn't attend the church would have the opportunity to hear the gospel every time their their child would sing in church. Mm-hmm. You know, they would come to church because they wanted to support their child and what their child was doing. Yeah, I went uh, when I was a member of Salem Lutheran, whenever we had the school choir, you knew they were playing in the service because you couldn't find a parking spot. You're, par- you're parking <laughs> yeah. outside of the lot on the road. And you're like, okay, yeah. so all the kids, kids from the elementary today. must be here, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, right. On special days, we have the <laughs> right. second and third grade choir, the fourth and fifth grade choir. And then you're like, whoa, now, now we really are falling out of the sanctuary with, yeah, because we right. have no seating. Right. Uh, to, to fit everyone. So, yeah, that's great points. I know at our school I've seen some openly confessing atheists in our choir, and I am mind blown every time mm-hmm. I see them singing praises to God up there, and I know, like, they don't actually believe that. So why are – but they're there. You know, and I'm just curious, like, what that will do to the – what what the Holy Spirit will do through that. Amazing even things. singing the words. It's, <laughs> it, as long as the words are there and the words are, you know, scriptural and pointing to Christ, I think – Right. It's it's amazing what this what can happen this way because if you're just going to be in a band, well, that you just go start a garage band, <laughs> you know, and you sing about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, not about Jesus, I would assume. I think that's a really good point because because what you said is it has to do with the words. Is if you have an atheist in a in a school choir, who on a daily or 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 block scheduled every other day basis is ex- exactly right, singing God's praises and and singing uh, biblical texts, um, that is a seed that, that is being planted that, like you said, the Holy Spirit uh, will, will grow. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how that's going to work, and we pray that it does happen, uh, obviously according to God's will. But on the flip side, um, seeing a choir as, as, a, as a community outreach can be a great thing, it can also be a bad thing, but it has to do, like you said, Andy, with the words that are being sung. Are the words um, law and gospel focused, or yeah. um, rightly divided with a gospel focus? Are they biblical, or are we just going to be singing about us in front of church? Right. And when the words are are right on, those seeds do get planted. Mm-hmm. And I, I would be curious uh, whether or not if if the music is, quote-unquote, bad choral music, bad choir music, the texts are terrible, for instance, uh, not biblical, or have just a twisted view of, of faith, um, how the Holy Spirit might might be able to work through that. It'd be interesting to see uh, if that brings somebody to faith, if the Holy Spirit overcomes, essentially, that bad use of, of choir or choir music um, to still work in that person's life. But yeah, you're right, Andy. I think when the words are spot on and biblical, uh, we're gonna we're gonna see a harvest. Yeah. According to God's will. Well, any closing statements or points about congregational singing, choirs, or any connection to church singing and evangelism that you would like to leave the listeners to mull over? Well, I, I want to go out and, and go ahead and say that I think the foundation uh, of the of the choir problem doesn't isn't rooted necessarily in church leadership necessarily. Uh, uh, I think it comes from the congregation. I think the congregation isn't singing, uh, and I think the congregation isn't singing and seeing a value in singing because our families don't sing mm-hmm. at home. Uh, in the car, uh, getting ready for worship so that those kids walk into church uh, knowing what the gospel is going to be that day, mm-hmm. knowing what hymns they're probably going to encounter that day, and not just seeing it one time or, uh, I guess, experiencing it one time, but they actually go in knowing what to expect because 
it's not just this random uh, emotion-filled experience. Uh, it's laid out and it's designed in a way that we know that we are, in fact, going to hear uh, the gospel. Um, I, I now, of course, I know this isn't the case for all men, and this isn't the case for all families, but uh, one of my childhood pastors, Andy, you were talking about the pastors and, and singing it out and setting an example. I, I had a pastor growing up uh, who's who's uh, now in heaven uh, singing. His name is Pastor Nathan Lesh, uh, and he's he's a Southern California pastor, uh, and he used to say that real men sing really loud. <laughs> and I can't recall a him growing up in church where I couldn't hear his voice, perhaps slightly out of tune, loud and raising up even above the organ itself. Um, because, like me, and I, I don't know obviously what was in his mind while he was singing, but I know for me, that when I'm singing, I know my sins, I know my faults, but I know that Christ paid for them. So when I sing a song like, I know that my Redeemer lives, what comfort this sweet sentence gives, I know that I am singing about my redemption. I know that I'm singing about my Redeemer, and I know that if if there's any little thing that I can do, it's to show up and sing really loud. Yeah, and, and, and I would agree with you, and I would also say, too, that I think the reason people don't sing in church is because they don't, aren't moved to the response, because that's what singing is. It's responding to God. So maybe they're not moved to the response because the preaching didn't do that. Maybe the preaching was more centered on stories about the preacher <laughs> instead of, about what Jesus has done for us. Instead of about sin and grace, it's about something else. Yeah. So that could, they're not moved to respond. They're not moved to sing. They're just, it's more, Sunday becomes perfunctory. Something I do. Okay, so I think that, your response on that basically says, share the gospel. That's the response. Yeah. Which is the theme of this podcast. So yeah. let's yeah. close with that. Remember, it is through Jesus Christ and his saving work through his life, death, and resurrection, that all your sins are forgiven, that you have certainty of life after death because he has been raised from the dead. As Jonathan just said, your Redeemer lives. And that's the message that reconnects us into a right relationship with the Lord. So let's go tell it on the mountain. Amen. See you next week. If you choose to accept it, share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O oh Lord.